to help select. Um, so we ask this every time just to see because it's fun. Um, how many of this is it's your uh, first mobile Portland meeting? Cool. Um, so my name is Matt Gifford. I'm one of the organizers of Mobile Portland. And because we have so many new people all the time, um, we do this. Um, so obviously we're about mobile. Um, we meet the fourth one day of every month except December, which we don't have a meeting because that conflicts you know, holidays and stuff. Um, we're kind of modeled after an organization called Mobile Mondays. Um, it's an international organization you may have heard of. We're not actually affiliated with them because they wouldn't return Jason's call. Um, so we have a website, mobile.com. We have a Google group. Um, you can figure out how to get there. Um, we have also a mailing list that you can sign up for at the site that is just announcements about the meetings. It's like two free emails a month. Um, so not a whole lot of stuff. The Google group, on the other hand, um, is people you know, with job offers or looking for help for stuff or whatever. Uh, we have a Twitter account at Mobile Portland. It's kind of mostly just announcements. And um, actually, I, just to see if anybody's interested, I created uh, Hash Mobile Portland on Freenode for any of you geeks who use IRC. Um, so if you use that, um, I've actually been hanging out there for a while um, to see if anybody would show up. And uh, nobody has it. Uh, so we have some upcoming events here. Um, so we've got tonight, uh, we've got the Portland Digital Experience, which is um, something that's, I think, part of Pi and, or is it just Rick? I don't know. Oh, it's Planet Week? Oh, okay. Music Fest. Music Fest, okay. Um, and then we have the next one's mobile Portland meeting. And then um, there's actually a mobile, uh, some mobile stuff at this uh, Oregon Bio 2012. Um, I recommend that you check that out if you're interested in mobile health stuff, because um, they have some stuff that you might be interested in. <coughs> Here's a few uh, user groups in the area um, that are kind of related to what we talk about here. If there's anything, if you have a group that you are a part of or run, let me know um, so that we can add it to this list. Um, Kaiku, kind of it's the first Wednesday of the month, the Android Enthusiasts, the second Monday, and Coco Heads and the JavaScript admirers are both on the fourth Wednesday, so you have to make a choice. And so uh, come around, and if you have any announcements about job openings or projects that you need help on, or oh, I don't know, any other talks that you know of that somebody here might be interested in, just raise your hand, we'll come around, and uh, just be patient because it's really crowded today. Hi Portland, I'm Rob. I'm the CEO founder of a company in San Francisco, and we flew up here specifically to come to Mobile Portland because it's simply too damn tough to find iOS Objective-C developers in San Francisco. I have a flight. My friend John here is one of my team members. Hey. You, can everybody say hi to John? Hi, hi John! <laughs> can I just ask, does anybody have kids in this room? I have a 10-year-old daughter. Her name is Cameron. And for 10 years, I've forgotten to get a gift, or even a card, or even a shout out thank you to her nephew, to her cousins. I'm building a social wish list for kids' gifts. It's an entertainment, education, and empathy-oriented app. Kids earn wishes. They come on, they create a wish list. And parents, grown-ups, uncles, aunts, grandmas get birthday and holiday reminders so you can buy at Starbucks while you're waiting in line, you can get those gifts for your nieces and nephews. Uh, I'm going to leave a bunch of cards. We have to actually head off to the airport, but I'm going to leave a bunch of cards. If anybody wants a card before I head off, just raise your hand and I'll go ahead and hand you one. What was the name of the company? Gifter. Gifter. G-I-F-T-R. Rob at Gifter.com. I bought the domain. <laughs> <laughs>
So are you, are you, are you for the job? Uh, Andy Eichel from Akitas. Uh, we're looking for some contract help doing iOS Android development. A little bit later this fall, if anybody's interested, uh, just see me later and we'll get worked up. Thanks.
What Jason was describing is, uh, in a little bit of history, um, Music Fest Northwest is an event that runs every year. Great, talented artists from, from all over the world come to play in the clubs here in Portland. And uh, that, what a lot of people don't know is that started about 12 years ago with the folks from South by Southwest. And uh, for whatever reason, they didn't continue with it. William Week picked it up, and William Week has been watching with uh, very keen interest what's been going on with South by Southwest in the year. So uh, what they've decided to do this year is do tech programming during the day, so tech and creative programming. And we're calling that the Portland Digital Experience. Um, any number of amazing speakers are going to be there. Mark Levitt, who my former boss from a couple times, is going to be there speaking. Um, James Keller, who you all probably know from Small Society, now Walmart Labs, as well as companies like Spotify, Shazam, Flipboard, um, and uh, up until about a week ago, Tumblr, but uh, Andrew McLaughlin, who's now at Betaworks. So, Bunch of great people from out of town, a bunch of great people from in town. That will be held Thursday, Friday, and Saturday of next week. Thursday and Friday are panels. Saturday is a hack day with uh, Spotify, MapQuest, Twilio, Puppet, and a few other folks. That's open to the public, even if you don't attend um, PDX. So we just wanted to let you guys know about that. Hopefully see you all at the hack day, and if you have the time and wherewithal, we would love to see you at PDX as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. So tonight is about responsive design. If you're a designer or developer, you've probably at least heard of this if you're in this room, um, if not actually tried to do it. Um, so, Christian Reed from Athlepath, he's the lead front-end developer there. Um, they just had a big thing with uh, Hoodie Coast. And here's, he's here to talk about why they went with responsive design and I think a little bit about how they actually did it. So here he is. Um, 
lot of people confuse us with being a timing company. Uh, timing companies, if you're not familiar with racing, are the people who are out on the course with the fancy timing equipment, like big clocks and big mats that read RFID chips off of people's shoes. Um, this confusion is mainly because uh, we're so associated with times, but it's also because uh, results display is usually something that the timing company takes care of. Uh, but we're not a timing company, uh, so we work with them to take their results <coughs> and uh, line and display the athletes. So when you think about their business, working with us is actually kind of a good deal because the physical part of their job, the physical act of taking equipment out, setting it up, and operating something, you're always going to need to pay somebody to do. But the display of the results is kind of an afterthought to that core business, and we completely take that off their hands. And then we upgrade what they're able to offer to their customers uh, by offering a, whether they're a sophisticated company with the time mats or they're a value-based company that uses paper and tear tags, uh, we augment the results that they generate with the test messaging and the emails with the results, and we're putting them on the desktop and mobile in a really nice way. And th those are all the things that are hard to do well. Um, and, and it's not something that they're good at, which is part of the reason why this industry is dying for so long. The other thing we do is we serve race directors. Um, we partly overlap with uh, the time we come, what we do for them, you know, with their results distribution, uh, overlapping with the time companies. But additionally, we do uh, automatic team and series scoring during an event. Uh, this is something that's traditionally really hard to do and that a race director does by hand, but we make it instantaneous. Uh, so a lot of them didn't do it at all. And we also do race registration, which is how we're making money. Uh, we get a percentage of each registration for an event. So what sets us apart from other registration companies is that we leverage our deep knowledge of athletes and their friends, and the results to do a better job of filling a race director's event and doing it faster than ever before. Because you can imagine as a race director, most of your costs are fixed. You know, you got to get a permit to close the streets, you got to hire people at the time, you got to have course marshals. So each registrant past a certain point contributes directly to your bottom line. And additionally, you can imagine how nerve-wracking it would be to put on an event uh, that's a year away and have all your registration comes in, come in the last week. So part of what we're trying to do is get people to register sooner for an event so that the event director is focusing more on putting on a good event and less on whether the money is actually going to show up. So, so our business is fairly multifaceted. That's why we sometimes have a tough time explaining exactly what so a little bit about our history. Um, the company is a brainchild of David Embry. Uh, went through several iterations before landing at Pi last September when we took over. Uh, the team consists of myself on front end development. Uh, Janichi Furukawa uh, does the back end work in PHP, and then Nick James handles all of our data. Uh, additionally, we currently sit at eight people. We have uh, Bob Mahoney at CEO. We have the Uber intern Eric Gorshak. Uh, we have a sales guy, Ryan Jefferson, and Whitney Dawson is now our community manager. So the prior iteration of the site was just focused on that data display and the networking of past results. And that team had done a good job of taking the concept and fleshing it out. But coming in and taking a fresh look at the problem, we felt we had to make some changes in moving forward. Now, the, the project was fortunate in that the previous team included Chris Wallsmith, who uh, was formerly a release manager on the Symphony PHP framework, and so we decided to keep that in place. Um, but we had some long discussions about the structure of the data, and we decided we need to mo migrate from Mongo to MySQL. <laughs> and finally, the front end was uh, formatted only to work on screens of about 1,000 pixels wide, uh, which was kind of a deal breaker. So, a little bit on my background um, and how we came to that decision. Uh, it's probably worth mentioning that I'm an athlete myself. Uh, I ran in high school and college, and I compete about 30 to 40 times a year doing uh, cycling races now. And I got hooked up with Athlete Path because I contacted David uh, with feedback about his site when they partnered with uh, the Oregon Bicycle Racing Association. Now, my background is in engineering as opposed to necessarily computers. Um, and while I studied mechanical engineering and then spent three years in the aerospace industry, um, Janichi was a childhood friend of mine and we moved to Portland about four years ago um, to work on our own projects as well as doing freelance work. And that timing is important because four years ago it was right around when uh, mobile apps were becoming popular with iOS coming out and everything. And we could have gone that route. And in retrospect, we probably 
probably should have because we've been right on the forefront, you know, we made some money. But uh, instead, we went, you know, the traditional uh, web building route. And so by 2011, um, I don't know if you guys have heard this like 10,000 hour mark, where when you put in 10,000 hours or something, it's when you start to really get good. And coincidentally, like four years into doing this, you know, 50 hours a week, I was starting to feel like I kind of understood it. And um, I was putting together the uh, I was putting together the site for my consulting company, and I was benchmarking competition. And I came across the Hicks Design website. And I don't know if you guys have seen uh, John Hicks's work, but it's, it's really great, and I highly recommend it, especially if you do uh, HTML5 development. But people were talking about I don't think you can see it, but there's a cool border around the edge of the site. And the thing that I noticed is that as you drag it in. This little navigation starts to move around. So you can see it moved up. And then it jumps up there, which and I just couldn't figure out how we did it. And I spent hours like trying to figure out what was going on. I did a bunch of Googling. I did a bunch of Googling and my project, which was supposed to take a couple weeks to put together this site, turned into like three months of digging for what it was. And I don't know if it had actually started being called responsive design yet. But there was a lot of people who were really excited about it, and you know, you can just see from what goes on the job site here, like this is this is amazing because it allows you to go from that really wide display and get the data into a way that makes sense. So, so what exactly is responsive design? And at its basic, it allows a site to adapt from a very wide display to a very minimal display, and uh, you can see on the site that Janishi and I worked on. Co-op at its wide display, it's got this nice big image. As it goes smaller to a tablet, uh, it's compressing that design uh, and tailoring it to that narrower display. And then on a phone, it's actually eliminated the images altogether. And not only is this more usable for somebody who's, who's actually playing on a phone, but it's also pushing less data because that image isn't being downloaded. So if, if you're doing it right, you can actually get everything that you want out of a um, a traditional setup where you're sniffing for a browser and uh, deciding if it's a mobile phone. Um, so we'll go a little bit into to what makes up a website if anybody doesn't know. Um, you've got your HTML, which is the content. Uh, you've got your CSS, which is your styling. That's what tells the content what to look at. And then the final component is the JavaScript, which is the action code. Uh, that tells you how the data is to be manipulated when it's on the screen. So at its basic, you've got those three pieces uh, that, that comprise a website. <coughs> and when you look at just that HTML, this is what it looks like. So before you put that styling piece into place, you've got this information here. And part of what makes doing standards-based web development, and this is <coughs> standards-based web development is kind of a nebulous term, but when you get down to standards-based web development, this is what it's talking about, is taking that basic information, that, that HTML page. And, and the, the reason why it's so great is that all this information is readable by a machine. You know, a Google can come through and parse all this information. A phone can decide uh, what's the best way to display this information based on its hierarchy. And people who are disabled, uh, this one people don't often talk about, but Someone who's disabled can come in here with a reader like JAWS, and they can read this in Braille. They can read it. Um, they can have it read aloud to them. So there's a huge advantage to doing it this way. So traditionally, when you add that style into that HTML, what you're getting is that one display. But what responsive design does is it says, if your screen looks like this, show it like this. If it looks like this, show it like this. And if it looks like a phone, show it like that. Which brings us back to Athlete Path. Um, when it came time last fall that we designed the site, we were new, uh, we were going to have to make it available on mobile. Uh, and it was going to be a big deal for us to do that because our whole business was based around people being out in the world at events where they wouldn't specifically have their computers, uh, but they'd have their phones. So it wasn't even a question that whatever we built was going to have to be accessible on a phone, but the real question was how. Now, one option would have been to go to the app route, uh, and that would have meant at least building an iPhone app. Uh, to this day, our, most of our traffic comes over iOS. Uh, but at the time, Android was started, just started to really gain traction, so we would have needed to build that as well. And we would have built a website. 
The other route would have been to build a mobile version of the site where we're sniffing the traffic to find out if it's a mobile phone and then sending a totally different built front end to that device versus sending it on, and then on a desktop sending back to the device. And then the other way was to do a responsive site, which is what we did because that's what I know how to do and it's kind of how I got hired in the first place. So um, there's been four different versions of the site. There's actually been a previous version uh, that David paid somebody to kind of mock up, but uh, there was the V1, and then since we got into Pi and the team took over, we've actually done three different versions of the site. Uh, and I, I'm not going to get into too much into the specifics of how it's all done, but I'd like to get into the why we just decided to go the ways that we did. So in the first iteration, we didn't have a designer associated with the product, and since we were working out why and Kennedy, we figured we'd eventually be able to cajole them into uh, helping us out uh, with design. And the other reason why we didn't want to have a designer at this point is we didn't know what the data needed to look like. Um, obviously, it's a list. You know, that's the obvious way to do it. It's the way people have always done it. But we weren't sure that that was eventually going to be the way that it went. Uh, we had a few inter insights from interviews, but not enough to say that we wanted to spend money on design at that point. So in the first iteration, we came with a very basic design. I, I'm not a designer. I just build the front end. And I just do this myself. And you'll notice that there's no flourish involved with any of this. I actually picked this font specifically because as I was going through, I think it was fonts.com, it was the font that did the most for, most design work for you. So I, I didn't actually have to do anything myself. Um, and so we just focused on trying to get that data in place. Uh, you know, what, what pages we're going to display, what bits of information, can we get all that information on the screen? And And we just had to beat the, the state of the art in, in the current iteration, which is PDF. So we figured we could at least do that much. And we did. By the end of the year, we were serving regional cycling races. Uh, people were really excited about that. And we actually beat our targets for development. And we were able to do a ticketing system for registering people for events uh, by the end. And we served, uh, began serving the Portland Triathlon, which will run this September. So you can see these pages, there's nothing particularly fancy. And unfortunately, we don't have a snapshot of what it looked like on mobile, but you can imagine this, this compresses pretty well. And we just did some basic things where we you know, draw a line or something every 10 people. And then we also did the registration. Uh, the second iteration of the site came into the spring and it got a little bit fancier. Um, we took a cue from Twitter. Uh, their data is actually really similar to ours when we started to think about it. It's a, it's a list of things, and you might be interested in one of the things and want to expand that data. Um, so what we did is we did this kind of list panel thing that they were doing, uh, and we just kind of ate exactly what they were doing, which is a list, and then drawers would kind of slide out of it. Um, so, so we just added that extra uh, bit of information. On mobile, it would just go down to a single panel, and you just move over to the uh, but, but the problem was it was really dissatisfying. Like, you just felt like you were getting cut off at every point. And so we knew that we needed to go back and, uh, and rebuild it again. And that's where, I, in the spring, we started on what's become the, the main version of the site that we see today. Uh, we finally had a feeling, we, we, although we were dissatisfied, we knew that this next version was going to be good. And so we finally called in our chip with Biden and Kennedy to kind of help us with the design. Uh, and they gave us two uh, amazing creative talents in Kristen Menard, who's been our uh, uh, head of design, and then she, she designed the logo and she helps us with the layouts. And then we also got Brad Simon, who's the illustrator for all the stuff that you see uh, that are starting to kind of make their way through the site. Uh, and it's probably worth mentioning that by doing the design for mobile and desktop and concert, it, we, we eliminated a lot of the cruft from our layouts. You'll hear these people talk about um, mobile first. And, and what they're talking about when they say mobile first is that when you focus on a really small display and you say, well, I've got to get the most important information, you start to eliminate things that aren't important. And necessarily for us, because we were now putting what was going to be on one panel on a phone on both sides, we could never have like all this extra crap that starts to work its way into sites. And so you keep yourself down a lot. And that's one of the main benefits you get from doing this type of design. You can see how this compresses. So on a, on a tablet, it'll stay in a, a dual uh, panel form, and then 
As it goes down to a phone, it'll uh, just be in one panel. So you can see how it works a little bit if you have to do our site.
Parker and Peter. Brad has been at UHL and has been really generous with his time. So if you guys all hit his website today, that would be amazing. <laughs> So I'm going to come around with Mike. If you have questions, just raise your hand and I will be there. Thanks. So I actually had the pleasure of using this after I did the coast this last weekend. And I noticed one thing that's that you, um, as you might you probably know, you lose cell coverage during the race from probably from about the last half to third of the race. I guess I'm wondering if you thought about employing things like app cache and local storage to make it so you can still enter results and data while you're, because when we have a runner finish the leg, we want to have data, and we wouldn't be able to do it until you got all the way to the beach. Yeah, that, that was going to be our uh, implementation of doing local storage or app cache, and uh, with the time crunch, we just sure. weren't sure we were going to be able to do it. Uh, I think it'll definitely be a portion of what we do for Hidden Coast next year, and probably also have a, a mobile app at that point, but um, I, I personally would really like to try to do that. How are you handling uh, images, particularly retina images? <laughs> uh, I had that. <laughs> oh, we have to do a check. So you can actually, I don't want to get too technical. That's what totally, it is. Not oh, okay. technical you can now. Oh, okay. Uh, you can actually do a check for uh, the pixel density of the screen. It's over um, over one, right? So you check for like 1.5, and, and if somebody has a you know a, a retina display on like a type uh, tablet or an iPhone or something like that, uh, you can send a higher resolution image. So we do checks actually all down the stack. Um, everybody gets the smallest image because we, we, we don't want to uh, we don't want to miss anybody who's on, a, on an old device. Uh, everybody gets that, but then down the stack you get the image that's appropriate for your device. And actually, on the front page of our website, there's a big uh, graphic. If you go to athletepath.com slash welcome, uh, if you've got a big device, dra drag it out to the edge, and we actually push you a different uh, image if you have a really, really big display. You showed all the iOS devices tonight. What about uh, Android? Did you do a lot of special consideration for different Android resolution? Um, we, we checked on Android. Um, we have a couple Android devices that we test on. The, the majority of our traffic comes in through iOS, and, and I know that could be a self-fulfilling prophecy um, if you're just designing for that one thing, but uh, to this point, we still see it's it's uh, in the high 60s uh, for uh, iPhone and tablet. And I don't know if that's our audience, because I know it's growing in other communities, but at least amongst the race community, it seems a lot of people are using uh, iOS. You mentioned uh, HTML and CSS. Um, what are the technical aspects of those two specifications that help to with responsive design? I mean, responsive design is a concept, it's also a technical aspect, not a specification, but um, what were the aspects of those two technologies that, that really helped you do that responsive design? Okay. Well, uh, HTML is basically just XML. Uh, CSS is so I guess. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I guess I, I meant I was I was assuming HTML5 and CSS3 and, and some newer. Oh yeah. Well, um, HTML5 is great because you've got an opportunity with the tags to make your information a lot more specific to the uh, the device that you're looking at. Um, that's Um, 
As far as CSS3, I, I think it's fantastic. I think the more that you can get out of doing your, um, your interactive stuff with the JavaScript and build it more on something that's uh, like going to be more robust and creates more nicely, I think the better off you're going to be. So that's, CSS3 has been great for that for us. <coughs> Do you have a specific question? Uh, question, and uh, I may be in the minority here, but my concern is branding and uh, testing your target market. Uh, when you downsize, it seems like you lose a lot of the branding. And the other side is, is that, did you do any testing? I mean, you go to White and Kennedy for the design, but how much testing did you do before you went to White and Kennedy? Uh, a lot of our testing has come initially. Uh, we did a lot of user studies in the beginning just to get what was important to people. And, and to be honest, I don't think we've done enough yet. Um, there's going to be, we're actually kind of going back to the woodshed. We've been working so hard on the coast that uh, we, we've kind of put a lot of that testing off. And through the fall, what we're going to try to be doing is refining everything that we've done up to this point and, and doing some of that testing that we should be doing. Okay. Uh, but to your point about branding, I, our feeling is that the user has always got to come first. Like, it's important to get your brand in front of people, but more than anything for us, it's people want to view the results, and they want to get excited about the races they've done, and they want their friends to see that kind of stuff. And it's our feeling if we're doing the, the right things to get that information in front of people, like, they're going to know who we are, they're going to be on the site, so we're not as worried about that. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, it sounded like you guys made an or decision of the students versus that. But at the end, were you recommending that you actually do both if you had the funds? And if yes, confirm that, would it be you guys, were you able to quantify, was it a time savings or a cost savings on why you chose responsive initially, if that was your criteria? Well, so I got hired onto the project specifically because this is how I recommended that we do it. Um, we were only going to have so much money uh, as the company was getting going, so designing multiple uh, apps and was not going to be an option based on the amount of money that we raised to that point. So this was just a cheaper way to do it. I think long term we will definitely have apps. I've got a follow up on the uh, the offline uh, question here. So part of the response to the design that you were looking at, I think, was the size of the device that you're using. The other aspect would be the context in which you're using it. You know, hood to coast, a lot of connectivity is down. Uh, part of it could be solved with app cache, but part of it is a UX issue. I, mean, I, I was in a situation where I was having to log multiple plays for the coast, and it was about a half a dozen plays to get from one guy to the next. So that, I, I sent in uh, feedback earlier today about tabulary, but, uh, <laughs> but it raises another question. You, you guys said that uh, intentionally you brought on design help later because you didn't know what you wanted. At first, or with some question. What about the when you brought UX design? Was that at the same? Was that the same person, the designer, the UX designer? Or did you have someone on UX earlier? Well, first of all, to anyone who did go to Coast and tried to input the time, I want to personally apologize. <laughs> <laughs> that was entirely my fault. <laughs> Every problem that we saw with people inputting times during the event. Uh, I could only think back to when I had argued for those specific things in our uh, reviews, and I apologize to you guys. <laughs> Going back to the guy who talked about user testing, we should have user tested all this stuff, and we would have if we had the time. And if we had, it would have been glaringly obvious that I was monumentally wrong. <laughs> but uh, to your question about UX, we actually haven't uh, brought on a, UX, a specific UX designer yet. I think as we move forward, that's probably something that we'll be looking at. I'm just curious as to uh, being new to responsive design and so on marketing. Um, did you just look at the desktop or laptop size and then a, a generic tablet size and a cell phone size? Or what about did you take into account some of the other on size tablets and that sort of thing? If we look at our data, it, um, and I don't want to say don't design for these other tablets, but like the Kindle Fire in particular is one device that you hear about all the time. And we see no traffic from that device. Um, a lot of the, you know, we 
uh, we had a colleague of mine went to Google I.O. and he came back with that Nexus 7 tablet. Great device, we still see no traffic from those. Um, on the tablet front, uh, the, the iPad is just dominating. Um, so we do all of our breakpoints. Anybody who knows what I'm talking about, uh, we do breakpoints at different sizes of devices. And uh, our breakpoints are at 768 pixels. So for as it goes below the size of an iPad. So we design to the narrow size of the iPad. Below that, we assume it's a phone. And in very rare instances, we'll look at the flip of the phone from wide to narrow and uh, make a change. But for the most part, uh, we just go below, anything below 768, we design it as if it's a 480 uh, pixel wide uh, phone or a 320 wide pixel phone and just try to make sure both of those work. You mentioned that uh, cost savings was the principal reason I recommend the responsibility to allow you to do it. But you also mentioned at one point uh, iteration speed and being able to redo everything at like three versions of the same site up there or something. Um, have you considered the whole like new hybrid native slash web view app which and can Did you elaborate? <laughs> Facebook app for iOS. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, where the animations are mostly native and then everything else is web views shoved in. Yeah, uh, that might be the first way that we go to having an uh, uh, iOS app. We're, we, we just haven't had a chance to look at it, but I, I have a feeling, just based on the way the site is architected, it might lend itself to us doing that. But it'd be a shame because I think the thing that you really get from doing an app is all those native. You know, all that native uh, uh, C sharp stuff that you're getting out of doing, you know, all the swipes and all the uploading photos and calling people from your address book. Like, that's what makes apps special. <coughs> it's not just that it's living on the desktop and someone's got that button to click. Um, from our perspective, you know, it's like there's so many neat things that you'd be able to do once you went to the app. You know, and we're staying at Urban Airship, like, for us, push notifications is going to be huge. We send a lot of text messages. And if we could offload a lot of them to be push notifications, not only would those be probably more palatable to our users and easier to navigate with, but they would become, uh, we would save a lot of money off it. So, um, yeah, we'll probably do that to start, but I would hope that eventually we'll go fully data on both, uh, both operating systems. So, sort of along the same lines, did you feel limited by the amount of gestures or touch interactions that you could offer? And did you find more solutions that you thought maybe you would have initially? Well, we, we specifically don't do any touch gestures right now. Um, swipes, I think, could be very compelling. I know there's you know, JavaScript, uh, the jQuery UI, I think, allows for that. We just haven't done it just because it's not, it's not as rock solid an interface um, on uh, I'm doing a responsive design, so we just avoid it altogether. So everything is done with touches. We actually do a lot with uh, hover states actually change a lot for us when we go to the layout below 768 pixels. Uh, just because when somebody touches something, that hover state is held for a while, and so interactions actually taking place start to become interesting. You're not really sure if they're happening or not. So, so to your to your question and going back to yours, like yeah, like. Going to a native app, you know, would be probably a lot better uh, than doing the responsive design in that respect. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the downside of some of the paid folks that use responsive? Well, I think if you're building a website, it's all upside to build it responsive. You know, it's going to make you a better job, and you're going to hit those people who are not going to have an app or are just going to serve aren't going to be inclined to download an app. Um, I think it gets back to what their, you know, their questions. Why would you want an app? Because you can have that much better an experience. Um, like for us, we can't upload photos from an event, or we can't upload someone's user photo from their phone, like, you know, at least on iOS. So those are limitations for us. So how are you doing SMS? I mean, do you have a gateway or do you have negotiated something? We're using Tropo, guys. Uh, Tropo. Yeah, Tropo. Uh, 
it seems like one of the uh, big upsides to having a <coughs> responsive site as opposed to an iOS app um, is the uh, ability to iterate. Um, how often do you change uh, the site, even just like small little things? During Henry Coast, we're pushing changes every couple of hours. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, we get more major stuff. The, the biggest thing for us was the. Um, Sensor nets, uh, are, 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 is Bluetooth 4 going to replace uh, the Ant Plus standard for uh, health and fitness sensors? Gosh, I didn't even know that Bluetooth 4 was challenging Ant Plus. For people who don't know, Ant Plus is a protocol that allows uh, things like heart rate monitors to talk to watches, to talk to GPS devices, it allows power meters to talk to uh, different things. Uh, there's a company called Strava that's uh, actually very similar company to ours in terms of kind of revolutionized fitness data. And what they are doing is collecting, um, they collect uh, GPS data. So as people work out, they turn that into uh, whole games, essentially. So you might be uh, you might be riding up a hill on your bicycle, and it times your time up that hill. And then uh, someone else will go and ride that at a similar time. But then they'll aggregate those times to say who's faster up the hill. Um, the devices that do that all run on this AMP Plus protocol, and it's really interesting because uh, devices that run on that protocol all get aggregated into that information, so they're sharing it out. So they're doing for training, essentially, what we're doing for uh, racing. Uh, for us at the moment, um, AMP Plus doesn't really affect us that much just because all of our data is coming in off the time and the things of their equipment is uh, completely different from the training so, uh, tools that we so, yeah, I don't really know. I've got a question about being that app versus a responsive site. So, you, the few examples you gave about why you would want to go with the native app is because of some of the things that you can't do today HTML, file upload, and contacts, and things like this. So, if, if some of the WC3 drafts get approved, and now you can do that in a web and a responsive app, would that mean that the native app would be less compelling in, in a case like this where maybe you're not doing onboard processing and data crunching? Yeah, you know, well, so anybody who's in this space um, is certainly aware, uh, and maybe you're, if some people here may not be, but there's, there's people who argue for web standards uh, for a lot of the reasons I outlined as far as uh, accessibility to the data uh, and, and its ability to be read by different Devices versus building things native, and it, you can you can look at our site and you can you can you can objectively say from that, well, wouldn't it be better if everything was built this way? And there are people who argue for that vociferously. There's realists in this building who say, well, this app ecosystem uh, exists and it eliminates a lot of the problems of operating over the open web, uh, so we'll just build in it. And I, I think that you know you have to be realistic about where you are right now. For us, I'm sure within a year's time, it will still be compelling to, for us to have an app that we will probably have now. Uh, 
I think long term it's really interesting uh, if it stays under the web, web standards. Uh, when you can design, instead of designing for just that iPhone and just that Android device, when Garmin comes out with a cycle computer and we're pushing specific pages to those devices over open standards, like, that's phenomenal. Like, there's, there's really compelling reasons to do that. You know, people always talk about the refrigerator that it's going to have a, a display in it. It's going to tell you what to order the milk and stuff like that. When that can access the same pages, and we're not writing a separate application for the refrigerator when it just reads what we've already got, you know, our site will work on a Kindle, even though, like a black and white Kindle. So I think that stuff is really great, but I still, you know, there's obviously compelling reasons today. If those things happened, yeah, maybe we would skip, but it depends on how the marketplace moves. You know, I had two girls come up to me, we were out at the start line for the Portland Dakota's walking race, and they came up and said, why do you have an app? And I said, well, you're looking at the three guys who built it right here. <laughs> There's a reason why we can't do it all. And they're like, you guys need an app, and they just walk away. <laughs> Thanks for coming.